you're clapping because after this you all get to go home. Why do some rural churches flourish and some churches languish? How do we keep rural congregations strong so that many can be made disciples of Christ? What makes a difference between a sustainable ministry and an unsustainable one? As Ricky's presentation pointed out, rural areas are depopulating. There are simply less people living in rural areas than in times past. In addition, rural populations are aging as young adults move away from small towns and villages looking for opportunities and employment. Yet some rural congregations and parishes are growing, while most are shrinking in numbers and financial resources. How do we, as church and as ministers of God's word and sacraments, help rural congregations and parishes to grow? I looked for answers to these questions in two neighboring parishes and the Anglican Diocese of Fredericton, which is all of the province of New Brunswick. I didn't name it. Near the town where I grew up, which is one of those on the map, there are two rural parishes. Anonymity, it's important. So near the town where I grew up, there are two rural parishes. One contains the church where my mother's family has been married and buried for many years. The other f contains the family farm where my, fa my, my father's family first settled when they arrived here. So I'm deeply tied to both parishes. Before I go any further, I want to point out that the title of my presentation has the words rural and struggling parishes in quotation marks. This is because the Anglican Diocese of Fredericton has a task force on rural and struggling parishes, and the task force produced a report on rural and struggling parishes. And while rural parish is relatively easy to define, struggling is not so easy to define. The task force, and by extension, the diocese, defines a struggling parish as one that is financially unable to employ full-time ordained clergy. Following that definition, approximately one-third of the Anglican parishes in New Brunswick are struggling parishes. By placing my title in quotes, I'm saying that I'm not making a judgment about what struggling means. I'm simply using the same definition that the church uses. According to that definition, one of the parishes I looked at is struggling, the other is not. In fact, one parish has been struggling for 15 years, while the other has not been struggling in my lifetime. And though the non-struggling or successful parish has benefited from being nearer to a town, both parishes are actually very similar demographically. Both consist of family farms and family woodlots. Both were settled in the late 1800s and have grown and declined at about the same rate. In fact, both parishes shared clergy from the 1940s until the 1960s and one congregation has been part of one of the other parish at different times. Yet, the successful parish built a new church, or a new rectory in the last decade, and a new church just three years ago. The struggling parish, and that's the last time I'll use air quotes during this presentation, can't afford to, play, to pay retired clergy to come up for more than two Sunday services per month. So in order to find out what happened and to make this project applicable to other parishes and pastoral charges, I chose a grounded theory approach. This means I looked for the factors that affected both parishes, but affected them differently. From there, I developed a model of how those factors affected those two parishes, and I hope that the model can be applied to similar situations in other parishes. At the end of this presentation, I will lay out the theory that I have developed and compare that to the diocesan response to the report on rural and struggling parishes, the Nicodemus Project. I will show that the Nicodemus Project, while an effective renewal project, will not by itself address the problems that led to one pair struggling, nor will it be effective by itself in maintaining the success of the other parish. To figure out the factors affecting both parishes, I conducted six interviews, three in each parish, with long-term members. Two interviews included two people. There was a gender balance of four men and four women, and all interviews were conducted within six weeks of each other. 
Interviews lasted at least one hour each. The same questions were used for each interview. From the vast differences in the way the respondents answered the questions, the factors that stood out for me were the role of clergy, community identity, and ownership. Theologically, Anglican identity and the work of the Holy Spirit were central themes. Let's see how these themes and factors were brought out in the answers to the questions. I've used alias for the respondents. Names beginning with the letter A are from the successful parish, and names beginning with the letter B are from the struggling parish. When I asked, where is this parish asked? Anne said, right now, well, right now we're starting to grow again. Agnes said, it seems to me that they're doing pretty good. Bernice said, Right now, it's at the bottom of the hill. And Bruce said, Well, we're certainly struggling, and we have been for the past little while. So people in both parishes understand where they are. Those in the struggling parish clearly identify the position of the parish, and the successful parish has a sense of cautious optimism. When asked how they felt about being where they are, the responses follow the same pattern. I do want to make a note at this point about asking questions in a rural setting to Anglicans. <laughs> rural Anglicans have the same sort of emotional reserve that Victorian Englishmen were famous for. I've heard Anglicans jokingly refer to themselves as the frozen chosen. And I, I have a, a phenomenon that I've identified called Anglican understatement. As an example of Anglican understatement, in the last set of responses, the past little while means 15 years. So when I asked how they feel, I heard what they thought. In order to get a word that described how the respondents felt, I often resorted to giving them a list of words to choose from. Having given that caution, here are, here are some responses to the question, how do you feel about where the parish is at? Alan said, hopeful. Anne said, yes, I, I could be hopeful about it. Agnes said, we were sad when the old church was torn down, but that didn't stop us from going to church. Bob said, it bothers me that the next generation isn't going to church, discouraged. Bernice said, well, I'm not happy with it, but what else can we do? And Bruce said, it's been a feeling of disappointment, I would say, all along. So not only do both parishes recognize the position they're in, the reality has a deep emotional effect on the people as well. As we will see later, the success of one parish, however it is defined, has had a positive effect on the visioning ability of its members. And as for the other parish, being a member means dealing with negative emotions. I was struck by the tenacity of the members in a struggling parish. It would be so much easier just not to go to church and not to have to deal with these bad feelings. Yet they chose to engage these feelings. We'll talk about why they're willing to do that later in the presentation. The central question for a grounded theory approach is to determine what happened. When this question was asked, the responses clearly spoke clearly about one of the central factors. I don't have a little sound bite from Alan, but Alan clearly identified that each rector has had different strengths and weaknesses. He pointed to the last rector in the struggling parish as the primary reason for that parish's decline. Anne said, we've had good clergy, all, clergy men, sorry, not gender inclusive language, we've had, but it's her words, we've had good clergymen all through and everyone we've had has been very faithful and sincere in their work. Agnes said, some of the people from the other parish have left, and they're coming here to our church because they got mad at the minister. Bob said, it's all got to do with how the congregation reacts to the minister. Bruce said, people are in the hospital. They always thought it was great to have a minister come and pray over them and for them and this and that. That seemed to drift off in later years. And Bill said, we don't have a steady ministry is one thing. We just have lay readers. From the interviews I conducted, the single most important internal factor affecting parish health is the minister, priest, rector, 
whatever title is placed on ordained clergy. In rural parishes, the ability of the clergy to integrate with the community, to use their strengths effectively, to visit with people, and to provide leadership is what can make or break a parish. Let me give you two examples from the interviews. I heard one story from three different respondents. It seems that one of the churches was in need of a coat of paint. The rector of the parish contacted the county jail, and one day, all the prisoners showed up along with several gallons of paint. The ladies of the church provided a lunch. By the end of the day, the painting was done. No one telling this story mentioned guards or security or anything other than the rector's good work in getting the work done cheap and getting the local detainees a day out of jail. Unfortunately, the paint was too watered down and didn't last long. In the end, the church had to, just as the old joke says, repaint. Repaint and thin no more. From the other parish, one of the respondents told a great story of how clergy can think outside the box and becoming a caring part of community. After becoming a widow, she was worried about getting her long driveway plowed so that she and her six children could get to school and to work. After the first snowfall, the minister showed up, started the tractor, and plowed the driveway. The minister was a former Benedictine monk, and I'm pretty sure he had no previous experience with agricultural machinery. However, he saw the need and he acted on it. Both of these clergy also did other intentional community work. The director who got the church painted by the local detainees also organized a series of ecumenical services with the local Pentecostal church. The snowplow priest also organized a community caring network where volunteers telephoned three or four members of the community each day just to say, hi, how are you doing? So both parishes have had good directors. I want to say very clearly at this point that good in this context means well suited to rural ministry. Neither of the clergy in these stories were noted for their preaching skills. In fact, one of them was noted for preaching over the heads of the congregation, literally. Not only were his sermons overly academic, he refused to make eye contact and generally preached to the rafters of the church instead of the people. Yet plowing driveways and freeing the captives for a day are actions that preach louder than words and more effectively in a small, tight-knit community than perhaps they would in an urban setting. Clergy need to live and to do God's work in the rural community. From Bernice I heard, I think if they had a full-time minister that lived in the area so that people got to know him, the church would grow. And in telling me about the last full-time rector, I heard this exchange between Bruce and Bill. Bill, she was full-time, but she lived at home. Bruce, I'd forgotten about her. I'm glad you mentioned her. She must have been here three or four years at least, wasn't she? If you're able to forget your last full-time minister, and the notable reason is that the minister does not live in the community, I think that's a very powerful statement. Bruce and Bill also hinted at some problems with clergy, but then backed off. Bill said that one of the rectors was awful demanding, to which Bruce replied, this is not the place for that. When that recorder is turned off and we care to go into anything, then maybe we'll have a better opportunity, wouldn't we? Bruce gave a similar response when speaking of another priest. This is not a subject, this is not the place to get into that, and anyway, it's not required. Now, again, because I speak rural Anglican as a second language, I heard volumes behind this reluctance to speak. This occurred in both parishes. I asked Anne to elaborate on a previous statement that all the rectors have been good, and the reply was, oh yes, there isn't any that, well, maybe one that all, but maybe not. However, I did hear a couple of stories about why things did not work out between the community and the priest in the unsuccessful parish. What I heard has led me to think that one mismatch between rector and parish can be rectified, but two in a row is deadly to parish success. At the same time, a string of good matches 
means that the parish is willing to wait to discover the unique features of each new minister. When offered a chance to dream and vision their future, responders in the struggling parish were almost unanimous in asking for full-time clergy in the parish. One person just wanted more people in the church so that money would start coming in so that eventually they could afford a full-time ministry again, but she held herself back from imagining that far. For a struggling parish, the vision and imagination does not dare extend past having someone, anyone almost, to be their community priest. Some don't even dare to dream that. Like a starving child who wants just one piece of bread, the people in the struggling parish had their imaginations and visions limited by their need. Look at this exchange when I said, but if you could wish for anything, like rubbing the genie's lamp, what would you wish for to happen in this parish? And Bill responded, I wish we could have a minister every week. That's it. Rubs the genie lamp and he wants a minister to show up on Sunday every week. By contrast, the successful parish was in a better position to vision. Since they have a regular minister, they could start thinking about wants instead of needs. And what they wanted was, Alan, revival. I don't know how both inside and outside the church. Get people more committed. We need an evangelist. And Anne said, I just wish there would be a miracle in some ways and the Holy Spirit would move in and wake everybody up. So the needs and wants of a rural parish begin with regular ministry and then move into revival through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now throughout this presentation I've used the word community as often as I have words for clergy. And Ricky's presentation, and actually Rob's as well, clearly brought out ideas of community in rural areas. For me to say that community is important to rural parishes borders on redundant. But there are several ways of looking at community and community identity that haven't been mentioned so far today. One of these is conflict. In the struggling parish, there is only one service on Sunday. This means of course, that either the parish has or the service has to rotate between points in the parish or two points of the three don't have any sort of regular service at all. The parish has opted for a three-point rotation in the summer and a two-point rotation in the winter. Not only is this confusing, parishioners have occasionally shown up at the wrong church on Sunday morning, but this also leads to potential conflict if one point seems to be favored or ignored in the rotation. In this case, every interview included some comment on the fact that one point had hosted the Christmas Eve service for several years in a row. This exchange is typical. Bill said, now we haven't had Christmas in this church for ages because they can get a bigger turnout in point two. Who said, more money, so they say. Bill, and they get more money. But is that a good reason not to have it here? I always figure that money is not everything, but you got to have it to run it. Bruce, I know there's people that come to Christmas and we lose those people if the church isn't Christmas Eve here. I notice that, and they don't seem to go to point two or point three. Bill, I know the wife's awful disappointed that we don't have Christmas here. Alan told me that the successful parish had avoided at least part of this problem by having one common bank account for all three points in the parish. Bernice stated that the struggling parish continues to maintain three separate accounts, one for each point in the parish. Community identity is especially difficult to navigate when it comes to church buildings. Between the two parishes, three of the six points are in communities where the church is the only public building. Train stations, Post offices, gas stations, community halls, all have disappeared from these communities. The only physical community object is the church. So now church is not just a place to worship, it defines a sense of place. Replacing an old church in the successful parish with a modern building was difficult. For two of the three respondents in this church, in this parish, this was the one thing they wish hadn't happened. Tied very strongly to ideas of community are ideas about ownership. In several cases, the successful parish members used the word we to describe what the parish was doing. In the struggling parish, they was used much more often. 
and ownership means paying ongoing costs. Alan, a former treasurer, spoke about building the new church this way. When we started, everybody said that they would give an addition to what they'd been given before. It's not supposed to come out of the regular operating budget, and I don't think much of it did. Anne echoed this thought. Kent, if it weren't for families like the Smiths and the Joneses, they're all sincere Christians and they tithe, and they give over and above. And Agnes said, in this new church, people are buying pews. They could buy a pew and get a plaque put on the end of it in loving memory. And they were $500 a piece. And most of those pews have those plaques. By contrast, Bill entered the interview with this thought. Where are we going to find a millionaire so we can get a minister back? Moving now to theological questions, each respondent said that church was where they experienced God. Bob told me of leading back, uh, told me of being led back into the worship space after a service to have a vision of God ordering the world. Many pointed out that this was not tied to one church building or even one denomination. Several pointed to wonderful experience of God in other places. Yet I heard there was something very special about Anglican worship. When I asked, let's pretend that this church had to close and you were faced with the choice of either going to point two on Sundays or maybe going to the United Church here. From what you're saying, your relationship with God wouldn't change whether you went to the United Church here or the Anglican Church in point two. Bruce said, I'd prefer if I had an option. If our church was closing and the Anglican Church was open in point two, I'd prefer to go there. Maybe because of my tradition or whatever, I don't know, but I would certainly, even though it would be so much more convenient to go to the Baptist right here, I would still like to go to my own church in point two. Bernice said, a lot of other churches are up. They have music and other things. They're more lively. It shouldn't make any difference, but it does. When you go to worship, you should worship. You shouldn't be thinking about music or something. It's nice to have hymns, but not this lively music. It's the difference in the atmosphere. Bruce again, it's something I look forward to and I enjoy. The fellowship with everyone and partaking in the Holy Eucharist. I think I've been blessed really over the years. So it's clear that those going to the Anglican Church find something that overcomes the negative emotions of being in a struggling parish. They have other choices, but their, Ang their identity as Anglicans is vital. I think the same thing ap applied to Ricky's uh, study with the United Church, that ecumenicism was important, but denominational identity is equally important. It's also clear that the Holy Spirit is at work in both parishes. In the successful parish, all three respondents spoke of blessing and the sort of coincidence that lets you know that God is acting in their lives. As just one example, Alan told me that the projector used in the new church was donated by a parishioner who won it as a door prize at a business convention. Alan said, the good Lord has been providing for us all the way along. It wasn't human hands that did it. There's a real sense of God's presence in the daily lives of all the respondents in either parish. So let's take a minute to review and begin to formulate a grounded theory. In the two rural parishes that I researched, clergy, living and working in the community was the most important factor. Clergy must be visible and caring actions as well as leading worship. For rural settings, this means visiting both at home and in hospital and finding ways to meet the needs of the church, both as an entity and as individuals. Preaching is less important. Poor preaching is a forgivable sin. Secondly, community and community identity is also important. Balancing the various communities in a multi-point parish is necessary. Solving the problem by closing churches is not always the best solution. This may destroy the last identifiable symbol of community. Having a sense of ownership empowers congregations to support their community churches. People will look after their own. Ownership shows up in we and they language as well as in the collection plate. And denominational identity needs to be preserved even as ecumenicism is built in rural areas. Finally, let God work. The Holy Spirit will bless and lead the church despite everything else. 
Back at the beginning, I spoke about the diocesan report on so-called rural and struggling parishes. That, this report resulted in a renewal program called the Nicodemus Project. There are five pillars to this plan. They are to relearn Anglicanism, prepare our leaders, support our struggling parishes, assess ourselves, and commit to transformation. Comparing these pillars to the factors I have identified in two rural parishes, it appears that the Nicodemus Project could be a key part of rural parish growth and sustainability. For example, if we prepare Next slide, please. If we prepare our leaders for rural ministry by building skills specifically related to rural ministry, we have a good chance of matching clergy to parishes. Assessing ourselves could include things like this research I'm presenting today. And committing to transformation may including, include developing that sense of ownership that empowers congregations to take charge of their own destiny. Supporting our rural parishes must include some way for clergy to live in community to be more than a Sunday visitor, if my research is applicable outside the two parishes I looked at. As it stands, and including the various initiatives underway, the Nicodemus Project will not by itself reduce the number of struggling parishes. None of the initiatives under the Nicodemus Project directly address the factors that I have found in these two parishes. However, along with the work of the Holy Spirit, the Nicodemus Project could grow and evolve to meet the needs for renewal in the diocese. As it is, respondents were only vaguely aware of the Nicodemus Project, and none mentioned its potential to improve their situation. Rural parishes make up the backbone of the Anglican Diocese of Fredericton. In looking at two of these parishes, I have identified several factors that must be taken into account as renewal and growth projects are developed. The tenacity, struggles, and blessings of being faithful disciples of Jesus Christ in rural areas create unique opportunities and unique challenges. May we as church embrace these opportunities and overcome these challenges to the glory of God in the name of Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. So be it. Rick. First off, great presentation, Kent. Uh, secondly, thanks for dropping my name so many times. That was great. Uh, uh, third, you talked about uh, the, I think it was the people from with the, the B squad, I guess, uh, with who only had lay readers. Uh, I was wondering if it came up at all, like when I when I did my research, attendance didn't change when we had uh, laity lead worship. Did it come up at all as to whether attendance changed when the retired clergy was there as opposed to a lay reader uh, on the on another Sunday? Um, no, it didn't. It didn't change much. Maybe one or two people, um, and that might be um, because every time the retired clergy is there, of course, they have communion, and the other Sundays they don't. And I think the attendance difference was more based on communion rather than clergy or lay reader. Um, but yeah. Uh, Bill said, we only have lay readers, and every other week they have the same retired clergy coming up. So again, it, they appreciate the guy coming, and most of their budget is going towards that. But still, it's not the same as having somebody there at all. Jody's uh, getting the exercise he would normally be getting at lunch by carrying around the microphone. Uh, Kent, I have a question for you, and I have a vested interest in your answer. Because on Saturday, I'll be in the diocese doing one of the formation units for the vocational deacons and postulants. Say hi to my mom. I will say hi to your mother, <laughs> and I will give a report on your presentation. Um, but uh, considering that I'm going to try to teach them how to preach in four hours, comment that bad preaching is is, uh, uh, is a forgivable sin. I'm very relieved the pressure is off. <laughs> um, 
the question is, I recognize in Parish B um, the importance of having someone resident. I'm wondering how wedded they are to having someone who is ordained a priest, if, for example, they could have a resident vocational deacon. Would the pastoral presence be accepted, or are they still attached in their image of themselves as being a, full, you know, a fully functioning church, but having a resident priest? Uh, you know, I think, I think a vocational deacon could work. Uh, a vocational deacon, or um, in this diocese, it, it would be quite often non-stipendiary clergy. As long as that person is, I, is identified by the people in the parish as their spiritual leader, and there's a way to do communion, um, our, our current bishop in the Diocese of Fredericton is not a huge fan of uh, having deacons use reserved sacrament. That, that only occurs in one parish. So th there, there would be some things to overcome, but yes, if they could have a vocational deacon supervised by the rector of a neighboring parish, which would be another difficulty to overcome, um, that, yes, if that person was living and working and visiting there, th I think that would that would work. But there's there's some obstacles there as well. Thanks, Kent. Um, on the Nicodemus project, there they, the, in in the, the little list there, it said uh, one of the headings was prepare leaders. Did yes. it say at all how they prepare these leaders? No. Um, and there's an annual clergy college that's a, 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 an expanded weekend retreat for clergy and some other things like that. But none of the things that are happening under that general heading of preparing our leaders is a directly finding a way to get this sort of thing, that, that to get clergy living and working and caring in communities. I mean, they, they need to run a course on caring outside the box. You know, if you know how to drive a tractor, plow somebody's driveway. That, that'll work. Thanks, Kent. Um, as a minister, a current minister in a rural pastoral charge um, that as the first minister to live in their manse um, within probably the last five or six years, that's probably one of the things that I get the most is that we're so happy to see lights on in the manse. Like for example, at Christmas, my first Christmas there, they, the manse committee said, we don't care how much your power bill goes up, just put Christmas lights up. <laughs> like that was... <laughs> so I'm wondering, um, within rural Anglican churches, because like I know that within rural United churches sometimes, having a house or not having a house um, makes a difference for whether or not the minister lives in the community. So I'm wondering, what's their situation? Do they have rectories or, you know, how are they willing to kind of maybe make the shift if the priest couldn't find a house or somewhere to live within the community? Um, the, the successful parish uh, built a new rectory within the last decade or, or 12 years or so. And um, it was really fascinating. It cost them virtually nothing to build the rectory because when they needed a hole dug for the basement, a guy showed up with his tractor and, and, and dug the hole for them. And then they knew a guy who drilled wells, so they got the well drilled. Like every, like, and that's how the church got built, which is right next door. The the struggling parish um, lost their rectory that was over a hundred years old uh, a few years ago and then they bought one for a while and then when the last person left they were forced to sell it so it's a real like they don't know how they would ever support a, a, a full-time clergy especially since they have to not only have a person living there, they have to find a house for them or pay a uh, housing allowance or however that works. 
they're about you know, they're about a hundred thousand dollars short of that every year. Lots of questions since I have one church in definite rural Nova Scotia and one in on the edge of the HRM. So um, one of the things I was really shocked about in your comments was that the all the churches didn't have Christmas Eve services. That really surprised me because every clergy that I know in the Anglican Diocese here were running all over the place on Christmas Eve to make sure that every single church has a Christmas Eve service. So that did really surprise me, and I would say that's definitely a recipe for disaster. And in my own situation, where we have a big church in Hubbard's and a little church in Mill Cove, our little church in Mill Cove for the last two years has had packed services, and it's because they've now got clean Christmas Eve's, Christmas by the sea, lobster-shaped um, tree outside, memory tree. <laughs> I, I mean, not lobster-shaped, but lobster uh, crops have created outside the fishermen have made it we've got you know people giving money for the lights in memory of their loved ones so they've gone from being um, like my parish had four churches two were two were closed before I arrived and um, that caused a lot of grief and they were actually thinking and three were closed one reopened the one that has the lobster trap fishing tree but um, I guess what I'm saying is that they thought they were closing and then they reopened just before I arrived and and um, they have gone from having feeling like the poor cousins to feeling like they have something special to offer. And it's not been, I mean, yes, I have been instrumental, but it's been um, definitely the Holy Spirit and people coming into the community who are from away, who have been embraced because they come to church, and us praying a lot about the CFAs getting along with the locals, a lot of prayer that way. And um, so now their Christmas Eve services are and um, so I would say I'm scared when I hear that there are churches out there in any Anglican diocese that don't have Christmas services. That, that's just very sad to me. And the other comment I have, kind of question comment, is when you said that um, that one man, I think he was from the B team, uh, you know, if the church had to close, would you go to a church in the other parish nearby, you know, that scenario, or would you go to the United Church? In my own parish, we have been threatened at parish council many times that if the small church closes, we're not going to Hubbard's, we are going to Blandford or Chester, you know, because they'll be so ticked off that somehow it hasn't worked out. So that threat, I think, and, and our money's not coming with us. Well, that threat, 30% of our income, is enough, I think, to really create an opportunity for the two churches to work together for the betterment of both of them. But I, my experience would, is, has not been that we'll go to the other church. We will go far away because we're ticked off has been what we've heard. But that's created, a, that's created a dynamic of competition to some extent, but also um, we have to make sure that both sides of the parish work because we both depend on it and we want to thrive. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a weird struggle of, of knowing that they have to work together and yet jealousy. I mean, B Bill and Bruce were jealous that church had been Christmas Eve and that's because they can only afford to pay for the minister to do one service. I mean, there's, a, the day that I talked to Bill and Bruce, I led the service and I think there were 15 people in church, including me, for the for the whole parish. So, you know, 10 or 15 people, and they're throwing in five bucks a piece. I'm I'm guessing because they can come up with, well, a little bit more than that because they have to pay his mileage too. But but they can afford to pay retired clergy two Sundays a month, and um, and mileage. When, when I was doing CPE, one of my fellow students was a, a, appointed to be their, their regular pastoral care provider, 
and the retired clergy was coming up once a month at, at that time. So they were paying this person who was not ordained, but a theological student, to lead services three Sundays a month, and and the other and the retired clergy would come up on the fourth Sunday. After the first Sunday, when they were both there, the warden came up to the student and said, "Don't bother showing up on the Sundays when the minister comes, because we can't afford to pay you both mileage to come." Like that's the kind of financial situation that they're at now, and I'm, I'm glad you talked about Hubbard's because they were threatened with closure. And what did they do? They either had to take ownership of the situation or kiss it goodbye. And they and they chose ownership. Or sorry, whatever, yeah. Uh, so I think the difference is ownership. How you get them to, to do that, I have no idea. Closed for nine months. And the minute that rector left, they reopened before I arrived. So they have a lot of feistiness to them. But, um, I, I guess, keep looking at the bishop I guess, back there. I guess to close this, I, I don't want to hold this too long, but um, that it sounds like such a defeatist thing. And, and you know, Millpool, on a weekly basis, we can every other weekly basis in Millpool, we can only expect about 24 people on average on a special Sunday to be there. 98 adults were there on Christmas Eve. We have two services in Hubbard's one in Mill Cove. That is, and, and, and that's amazing. And that's happening more and more with special occasions and gradually happening, but it's because they want to grow. And they, they are thinking in terms of Holy Spirit. Because if they were thinking in terms of paying me every other week to come out, and if they were thinking, they'd be dead in the water. And let me tell you, the water is right there. There are often more seals in the water than people in the church on Sunday mornings. But they, they, have a, they have a sense that we can do it. They have a sense of that. Whereas the church seems like it's defeated. Yeah, yeah. In a previous uh, parish that I was with in, in the Diocese of Huron, Two Point Parish, little country church, and a church in town. The church in town fell $20,000 short of their budget every year and tapped into the reserve just to pay the shortfall. The little country church that seven families supported always had more money than their budget required because there was a sense of ownership in the country church and not in, in town. That ownership, it, if you can get a congregation to develop that, again, I don't know how that works, but they can, then they have a chance of survival. If not, yeah, lock the doors. Lock the door, send everybody home. Because it's going to happen. Any last question? John. Wow. You deserve a question. Um, can I, I've sometimes heard it here uh, at seminary that um, clergy should try to work themselves out of a job. Essentially, I create a congregation where the people are self sustaining and able to carry on when a minister leaves. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can kind of comment on that because it seems, and I'm going to make a generalization here, it seems like Church B is making an excuse for not being sustained and not growing um, when there are other ways that you can do church um, together with, without the clergy. And, and, you know, and this plays out when it comes to, um, when it comes to like lower levels of clergy people, uh, more clergy retiring in the next 10 years, all these kind of factors that suggest there's going to be less we're going to end up with more and more scenarios like that. Yeah. Um, the successful parish normally goes somewhere between nine months and a year and a half between um, losing one rector and going through that whole process of getting another one. Um, and during that time, it's, it's nothing but lay readers and maybe once a month somebody else gets out there. And they find that a time when they develop, a, when they redevelop a sense of community, and they find they're quite happy to be led by lay readers for a year or more. Whereas parish B, yep, very, very much the defeatist. We have, we don't got nothing but lay readers. Uh, you know, they're, 
it, it's a whole different mindset. Now, maybe because this has been 15 years that this has been going on, that they're, they're discouraged. They, they don't see any way to move forward. But yeah, there's a huge difference in attitude. And if you have the right attitude, you can, you can survive anything. But still, I think after a certain point in a sacramental church where only ordained clergy can enact this, the, the, sacred, the, the central act of the church, the Holy Eucharist, lay readers, lay readers can work for a good long time, but eventually you need somebody there to lead Eucharist somehow. Thank you. Well done.